So guys, first all of right. all, maybe you can give us the story because, you know, Josh, this is the first time I'm meeting you, but I've known Pat for many years. And I know, you know, you worked on a lot of low budget stuff and, and a lot of that whole paying your dues thing to, uh, to reach the echelon that you're at now. So how did you get connected with becoming the writers for the Sonic the Hedgehog films? Um, yeah, we had been working for a long time. I mean, Josh and I have been working together since high school. Um, and we did a lot of l lower budget movies but it was because of, we did a uh, an animated show on Fox called Golan the Insatiable. There's hey, a picture hey. of Golan right back there. I love that show. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was, we got to do two seasons, though, obviously it never became super famous, even though it was on Fox. But that sort of got us into, you know, general meetings around town where agents sent us around to meet everyone. And mostly everyone wanted to, us to do more cartoons. But we started just telling people like, no, we want to make a big movie. And uh, we had a meeting with the producer, Toby Asher, who works for Neil Moritz, and hit it off with him. But he had a picture of Sonic just on the wall of his office. And we were like, Sonic, are you guys, is there a Sonic movie? And he was like, yeah, but don't worry. We, we, you know, we have writers for it. And we sort of volunteered, like, but we're the writers who should do it. After they fail, call us. We know how to do it, even though we didn't know yet. But we knew we could figure it out. And a few months later, he did call us and we talked our way into the job with just great levels of enthusiasm, I think. Yeah, it just goes to show if you ever have meetings with people, just point at things in their office and start talking to them about it. So Sonic 1 came out right before the start of the pandemic. And for most films that did that, they were kind of dead on arrival in theaters and then theaters shut down. How did Sonic make like 300, 400 million dollars, however much, in the middle of a pandemic? That is crazy to think. And plus, um, you two are now responsible for the greatest, uh, in terms of box office revenue, the greatest video game film franchise in history. How surreal is that after all the, all the little projects you guys have done for so long? Uh, very surreal, but everything else we ever did, uh, you know, some people would like it. We'd meet people years later who we found out were fans, but right when they came out, we could never tell if anyone even saw it. It was very weird to start working on movies that people actually cared about before it was even out and would discuss them online, sometimes negatively, but even that was I kind of exciting. <laughs> Sonic 1 with our, our original trailer with the original design of Sonic was a real test of the theory that there's no such thing as bad publicity. You know, we people would say that to us and we were like, is that true? I guess we're going to find out. But uh, at least people were talking about the movie and then we came back with the new design and the film came out and people really came out and supported the movie. And we really only got, yeah, we got about three weekends in the theater before COVID shut everything down. So we definitely count ourselves very lucky with the timing of that. that yeah, you know. I mean, I think we would have, I think part two shows that we could have made even a little bit more, but we definitely squeezed in. A lot of other films were not so lucky. So we'll always feel fortunate for that. So Sonic 1 being a massive hit, having worked in the industry myself for a while, I know a hit is both a blessing and a curse. I mean, Pat, you, you and I were working temp jobs for a while, barely scraping by. So you definitely pay, paid your dues, Josh. I'm sure you, you, were, you were the same way. But then to have a hit, there's then the immense pressure of what next. So how much, as opposed to coming into Sonic 1 and no one really knew kind of how it was going to do. And there was the initial bad publicity with, with, with the original design that came out. And the fans were like, how dare you make Sonic look like that? And then Sonic becomes such a massive hit. How much pressure did you guys feel about now you have to write Sonic 2 and make it even bigger and crazier? It was a lot of pressure, especially because it had to happen fast. But I mean, uh, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong. I also feel like there was something kind of liberating about it because doing the first one, when we started doing that, like it didn't feel like the studio, you know, was that concerned with, 
the source material, obviously they wanted the movie to be good, but I think, you know, unlike something like Spider-Man or Batman, a lot of adults who didn't play video games, uh, it's harder for them to wrap their heads around the fact that they have this big loyal fan base. And so with part two, it was kind of fun to now be like, well, now this one's really gonna, I think, be the Sonic movie that fans want to see. Obviously there was the pressure that we had to get it right, but it also kind of felt like it, certain elements we knew people would just be excited to see tails and knuckles in there. I need to pan my camera around for a second and show you this. We have big Sonic over in our photo booth, but we also have little Sonic down here. Hey, little Sonic. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Love it. They're big fans. So, I'm sure people probably have questions. We have a microphone up here if you would like to ask something to Pat and Josh. Come on up. Hello. Um, I have a very stupid question, and my friend who lives in Canada dared me to ask you this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to regret my decision saying this. What do you think Sonic's political beliefs are? <laughs> I think he just wants everybody to be friends. Sonic's yeah. all about friendship. I, I don't think he's thought too much about politics at all. He's sort of a carefree kid and uh, he's not very serious minded and probably doesn't really watch the news or anything. Thank you. I also have one question. What's with the advertising in the film? I heard something about like the Olive Garden not being planned, but like, what about like the Oreos or the just the Zillow thing within the script of the first movie? I don't know about Zillow. I, the Olive Garden is, I, I think it's now slowly becoming um, uh, not a secret, but we are all kind of taken aback with the people being mad about the product placement, which just showed us all that we didn't even know what we were doing because that wasn't product placement. The Olive Garden didn't give us any money for that movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think like... Sonic likes Mellow Yellow, and all the all we got for that was like some cases of Mellow Yellow. I think Zillow was product placement because that was like there was a different version of the scene. She was just like, I've been looking up apartments, and then it was I think it was only at the premiere that we saw the version where they'd inserted Zillow, and we were like, what the? But I mean, that's how movies get made. Yeah. Every little bit of money counts, I suppose. That it's probably just, paid for some of the special effects. But it just showed us that we should have charged Olive Garden money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I, I'm sure you guys got paid in truckloads of breadsticks coming to your house like every other day. Is that like the basis of your diet at this point? I wish. They didn't give us anything. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you both. Thank you. We have another question? I just want to say, uh, I've been playing the Sonic game since I was tiny with my brother. And what you guys did, what you wrote, like, I cried watching too. Aww. It meant so much to see. So thank you so much. I get to share this with my son now. Aww. <laughs> and, um, your, what was thank your favorite you. game when you were a kid? Which Sonic Adventure 2, so I'm nice. really excited about what might come. <laughs> and where's Rogue? Oh. I want Rogue. <laughs> well, I mean, well. <laughs> now, I don't know if Josh did, but I can tell you Pat and I used to work together at Insomniac Games. So if you're familiar with the Ratchet and Clank series or yep. the Resistance games, Back before this guy was making $300 million movies, he and I were playing video games all day and getting paid paid to do it. <laughs> it's true. So logged a lot of hours Thank on you. Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> a lot, a lot of hours playing Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> uh, we did just start, we found out you can get Sonic Adventure 2 on Xbox. So we have started playing <laughs> that. We were both playing it, yeah. <laughs> the joke. Hey guys, what's up? Hey. 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 Um, before I ask the questions, I just wanted to say that the first Sonic movie, um, I I saw it for the first time back in December of 2020. And I just wanted to say that it was the perfect way to kind of break the curse of these movies that adapt video games and just don't really do do that well. And as for Sonic 2, I've seen it in theaters twice already. And awesome. <laughs> yeah, 2 is just 
I, I don't know. I can't sing the praises of two enough. It's just perfect. Um, but as far as questions go, um, um, back in April of 2019, when we got the infamous trailer with Gangster's Paradise and the really terrible version of Sonic, what were you guys' overall reaction to when, to when you saw Sonic? Like, did you see the concept art and, and were like, eh, this doesn't look right? Or was it the opposite? Well, we hadn't even seen... So, you know, I think it all worked out for the best because we ended up getting the Sonic that everyone really wanted. The last concept art we saw, though, that the world has never seen was something that was kind of somewhere in between the Sonic we got and the Sonic from the trailer. So the first time we saw the finished one was in the trailer. And I, I didn't, I don't think we had as drastic a reaction as the public did since we'd seen the in-between one, but we were kind of like, huh, I wonder why. Yeah, we were like, um, I'm not sure about this, you guys, but it also wasn't really our place to tell anybody that. I mean, yeah, we they don't listen to like, the writers on Gangsters design. Paradise. Like the whole trailer was really weird, but it was like, yeah. we're just the writers. Um, but we were very happy when they ended up changing the design. And obviously yeah. we wound up with a design that's much better that made the whole movie work. Yeah. So we, we need to take a quick pause because uh, guys, I know we were running a little bit late. We have the award winners for <clears> our <throat> cosplay costume contest. We had over a hundred entries. Thank you, everyone who dressed up. You made today absolutely incredible. I'll introduce uh, Oscar Herrera here has the awards. So first of all, our three to eight year old winner who receives a Sonic the Hedgehog Lego set is Killian Hawkins. Is Killian Hawkins here? Killian Hawkins, right here. Congratulations, Killian. That Lego set is all yours. Next up, we have 9 to 12. 9 to 12 is getting a $100 GameStop gift card. Our winner for 9 to 12 is Logan Hawkins. Where is Logan Hawkins? Right here. Uh, they're walking away with all kinds of stuff. Okay, the next person wins an Oculus Quest 2. Oh, wow. <laughs> 13 to 17 is an Oculus Quest 2 and a case with it. DJ Downer, is DJ Downer here? DJ Downer, if not, we have, have your email. DJ Downer, right, right here, wins an Oculus Quest 2. Have fun in virtual reality. Congratulations. And thank you for dressing up. <laughs> Finally, our last winner, they receive a gaming chair, gaming keyboard, and a gaming mouse to play plenty of Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> TM Mermaid Man Lardis. There we go. <laughs> they, they are the, the Wonder Twins, guys. Well done. I don't know about no Sonic. But if you guys ever want to see a Mermaid Man and Barnacle live action movie, make some noise and bait these guys. Plague them on the Twitter. <laughs> Congratulations to all of our winners. Good luck carrying that out of here. <laughs> Okay, we have still a line of people wanting to ask questions. So next up right here. Hi. Um, so I was kind of curious, what was your decision to have a character like Agent Stone? Like, why didn't you make Robotnik like a total lone world for something? Um, I mean, you know, that's actually a great story for the actor Lee 
is the original version in the script, he wasn't as big of a character, but Jim Carrey just felt that he needed somebody to talk to. And he would keep adding him to more and more scenes. And the character kind of evolved from there. So we can't even take too much credit for that. We just knew that he was a person in a position of power and it made sense that he would have an underling, but. And to give him someone to talk to when we really needed it. But really, yeah, the way Stone evolved in that relationship, most of it came from Jim and Lee working it out on their own. Um, and then we we built off of what they did in part one for part two, obviously, and now really fully incorporated uh, Stone into the And whole seeing thing. that the fans in- Seeing how much the fan, that's a perfect example of something that changed because we started working on two before one came out, but finished one, obviously, after it came out and seeing how much uh, the fan base embraced this new character of Stone kind of realized like, oh, this guy's got to be in a lot more of two than we were originally planning. Guys, we we need to also do a quick follow-up about working with Jim Carrey. Because we're, we're all kind of early 40s-ish, right? So we grew up watching In Living Color, <laughs> Ace Ventura, The Mask. Like those were our childhood. And I know when you're in the industry, you can't fanboy out. But how surreal and weird was it after growing up watching Jim Carrey to be able to put the words into Jim Carrey's mouth? Uh, very surreal. We, we were shocked and amazed that he agreed to do the movie. When they told us they were offering it to him, we initially thought, like, does Jim Carrey want to make this kind of movie? Uh, and it turned out he uh, did. <laughs> I mean, the craziest thing is like brainstorming with Jim and we having experiences of kind of like pitching him an idea for a scene that maybe didn't even make the movie, but he'd be like, oh, yeah, like this, and then kind of act it out right in front of us. And we're just getting like a personal Jim Carrey movie that nobody else gets to see, only us uh, in real life, which is really crazy. And it, seeing, it did grow up on him, you yeah, know? It's and seeing, like, uh, oh, sorry, Pat. No, go ahead. I was just saying, and seeing a whole, the whole film fan out on him, because uh, when we when we visited the set in Vancouver for part one, uh, we talked to Adam Pally, who plays, you know, the dopey uh, Deputy Wade in Sonic 1 and 2, and he was talking about realizing how often he just quotes Jim Carrey movies in his daily life and realizing that he couldn't do that. Like he was like, he was like, I don't want to look like a nerd. So he didn't want to do it in front of Jim and had to like restrain himself. He was afraid he was going to accidentally do some classic gym lines without even thinking about it. Yeah. Got to watch myself. <laughs> well, and, and guys, you said the film was shot in Vancouver. It was shot in Vancouver in Klamath County because there's about a one and a half second clip of the truck driving from the Oregon border into California down around like Tule Lake Malina area that shows up in the film. So technically, Sonic the Hedgehog was made in Klamath County. We can claim that. <laughs> you guys, you guys got to build a sign, put it up on the road. <laughs> Next up, if you have a question. Uh, I actually have two, if that's okay. It's okay. So before I get to my questions, I would just, before I get into my questions, I actually, I wanted to, to tell you, I loved the first movie and I just love how at the end, how Robotnik was kind of going crazy, you know? And I thought that that was like a nice touch for how <laughs> he's mad at Sonic. He, and my questions are, one, is Amy looking for Sonic out there? We can't talk about that yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, that's top, top secret. But, you know, things are in the works. They, there's these things called non-disclosure agreements that everyone yeah. has to sign in L.A. <laughs> okay. And my second question is, do you think Sonic likes spicy chili dogs? <laughs> like, does, does he, he like spicy? spicy? Yeah, spicy. Yeah, I think he does. Yeah, maybe medium. I mean, he grew up in Montana. I don't know that he's eating a ton of spicy food there, but he's adventuresome, though. He's run all over the world. I'm sure he's tried a variety of chili dogs from a variety of countries. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Danny, and my question was, um, what do you think of Sonic as your friend or as your hero? I'd say a friend. Uh, we, Pat and I, when we were kids, we played a lot of Sonic 2 in particular on the Sega Genesis. Um, so, you know, there's that that feeling that you kind of grow up with a character and it's really exciting to now in our adulthood as our job to be, uh, you know, involved with thinking of things for him to do. Yeah. But in a way, I also think of it as like we're almost his tormentors since we keep coming up with all these terrible situations. Yeah, to we do him put in. him through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but we always know he's he's always going to come out up top. Um, out of the three Sonic characters, you put it in Sonic the Hedgehog two. Which one's one is your favorite? Uh, personally, I really liked writing for Knuckles. He was a lot of fun to think of. <laughs> think of things for yeah i mean i think of the three sonics my favorite character but yeah writing for knuckles in part two was a lot of fun like coming up with the way that he could be cool and tough but also find the humor in him and in his bizarre worldview it, you it seemed like you almost wrote knuckles like um heath ledger's joker like why is so serious <laughs> Well, you know, we in our minds, he was Worf from Star Trek The Next Generation. There's a secret for you guys. Yeah, that was sort of our starting point. It was like, what would Worf do here? <laughs> oh, yeah. Kool Aid Man. <laughs> Just don't remember the costume, okay? Um, my name is Anthony. I am a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog games, and I watched the first one. And Tails just come out of the end credits. And I saw the second movie. And I saw Shadow after the end credits. So I was wondering, are you going to put all of Sonic's friends and his revivals in the third movie? Again, unfortunately, we can't. They would get very mad if we reveal anything about part three. But I think it's probably safe to say that um, there's a good chance that we'll be seeing some more yeah. Shadow very soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Did, did we just hear breaking news that there's a Sonic 3 in the works? What? I don't think that's breaking news. They announced Yeah, there, there is a Sonic 3 in the works. <laughs> there's a Sonic 3. I always got one question. Is... Jim Carrey is going to be retiring. We hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jim is going to do what he wants to do, but we're thinking that hopefully he will not actually retire and he'll be around to be, to be Eggman some more. Uh, but that's up to we Jim. We can't say for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's up to Jim. Yeah. Next up. Are there any plot lines you'd love to introduce into the movie franchise, whether they be from the games or even the comics? I mean, yeah, again, you know, uh, we have to be careful of commenting on things that people might construe as revealing plot lines from three. Again, the fact that Shadow is clearly going to be in the franchise moving forward, I don't think it's revealing anything to say we would love to incorporate elements from sonic adventure 2 and shadow the hedgehog uh his his solo spin-off game so for, fortunately there's plenty of lore for you to pull from for, from the franchise for, for story ideas yeah yeah i mean so many stories in the games yeah and the comics and especially so many more characters that we haven't gotten to yet like it's such a rich universe of characters all of whom kind of have their own stories and have stories that could be expanded upon uh, and give it a little more depth as they become movies too, I think. And I think just in particular, we're excited, you know, because it's only the very end of Sonic 2 that we finally bring Knuckles and Tails and Sonic together as a trio. Uh, so I think we're both excited about the possibilities of what more fun they can have together in the movies moving forward. Okay, next up. Hi, 
Hello. My name is Tammy, and I'm about as old as Kurt, so I guess as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say for me, um, your knuckles reminded me a little bit more of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I was thinking of, you know, Splinter and Shredder, how they're very cut and that samurai kind of, but the sequel, I was so pleasantly surprised. Usually the sequel's not as good. And I would say you guys were the opposite. Um, instead of, oh my goodness, Sonic, what do we do with him? This movie, we just accepted he was there and you guys moved forward with the plot. And it was just the whole two hours, I was mesmerized. I was belly laughing at Rachel on the golf cart. That was like <laughs> genius. That was probably, you reeled me in right there. Just that whole I was not expecting it. You twisted it so well. And it was just, you, you roped us in. Like, it was delightful. Do you guys work in person together? I know you're on different Zoom calls today. Uh, yeah, usually we do. Sonic 2 was a little bit different because that was the very beginning of COVID lockdown. Uh, so for us, that was a lot of phone calls and Zooms and just kind of touching base and then periodically getting together for you know, walks where we're awkwardly Outside. standing like six feet apart. Uh, <laughs> but usually we get together almost every day. We, we live about 15 minutes away from each other. So we spend a lot of time together in real life, even though then when it comes time to writing, writing pages, we sort of talk through the scenes of what we're going to do. And then often we'll be like, okay, I'm going to go write this sequence because I know how it goes. And Josh will go write another sequence and then we'll sort of trade. Um, but we are together. A lot of the time we're we're best friends and we spend spend a lot of time together <laughs> okay thank you it's obvious that you guys had fun with this movie which made it fun to watch and my oldest daughter as soon as they said 50 years during the credits she knew she just <laughs> lit up before she even saw him and so we're really excited about the third movie so thank you for your time awesome thank you thank you so tammy uh, it, just uh, FYI, these guys have been working together for years. They've done tons of projects. Their specialty is either comedy or horror. T it tends to be kind of the, the areas where, where they work the most. But uh, Tammy's daughter participated in a film camp that I teach every summer last year. Hey there, what's up? And Pat was nice enough to join us for that film camp and talk about screenwriting to the kids. And we also showed the cartoon show that they worked on. Golan the Insatiable. Wait, is it, is it Golan or, or Golan? We Golan. It, but Golan. But, yeah. yeah Golan. Uh, a lot of the episodes are on YouTube. Has there ever been a DVD release of that? No, because uh, I feel that the that was during kind of the height of people thinking no one wanted physical media anymore until there became so many different streaming sites that you couldn't afford to have them all. Now I think the world's <laughs> starting to slowly remember that it's nice to own something you want to watch, but it's all there. I think they're still all on Hulu actually. Okay. Oh yeah. It, it, it's on Hulu. It is one of the funniest, if not the funniest Fox animated shows of all time. I, I adored the show. They kept moving it around on TV. So I'd like miss an episode. And it's like, it's on Thursday. And now it's on Tuesday. And now it's on Sunday. <laughs> uh, and then they just canceled outright. But that show I was so bummed when it disappeared. And it wasn't no just Pat that, that you and I had worked together and, and I knew you. That, as an animated show, just hit all the right tones. So at the end of this, I have the trailer from Go on the Insatiable Loaded that we'll get to watch up on the big screen. And I highly, highly recommend you go check it out on Hulu. You guys have some other projects that, that you want to plug, like maybe some of the horror stuff or some of the other projects that you two have done together? Uh, well, we'll plug. We have a movie that's coming out the first weekend of December called Violent Night, which, despite its title, is not a horror movie. It's like a act. It's an R-rated action comedy about Santa Claus, in which Santa Claus has to um, take the law into his own hands and fight some bad guys to save a family on Christmas. Uh, we also we we've got a horror movie that uh josh directed and i starred in that we made 20 years ago that's <laughs> just gotten a blu-ray re-release that you can get at severinfilms.com called hey stop stabbing me that's a, a very ridiculous horror 20th comedy. anniversary re-release next up question um i got one question uh 
So, do you have anybody that's going to play Shadow? I mean, they've been talking to someone currently, but we can't. They would murder us if we <laughs> told you. And they haven't said yes, so. But I think that the, the intention is to get another big movie star to play Shadow. Uh, but we'll see who it ends up being. Sorry. There's some things that in Hollywood you can't talk about until it's publicly announced. I'm sure they would love to tell you, but they can't even, like, tell their girlfriends. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's to total top secret. Cone of silence. Next up. Is there any chance that you will be using uh, Live and Learn by Crush 40 for the climax for Sonic 3? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I think there is actually a decent chance we'll finally get some Crush 40 in the next one because there's been so much public outcry. The, the no, producers are aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what kind of deals need to be made with the band? You know, uh, you can't you can't always do everything you want in movies. But yes, that I don't think that's revealing anything too secret to say that that has been discussed by the powers that be. Yeah. I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of Sonic, and I wanted to know. Were you the ones that made Sonic EXE? No, we've only done the, the two movies. Those are the only Sonic things we've worked on. Yeah, the, so, the, you're talking about the like the internet sort of horror thing. We, we did not have anything to do with that. <laughs> um, and in Sonic 3, will there be a new person to add to the Sonic team? They can't talk about it, Sonic 3. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, just generally speaking, I think it's safe to say probably in each new Sonic movie, as long as the public has an appetite for them, we'll probably keep adding yet another person in from the game universe. Yeah, at least one new character per movie, probably. Amazing. We want to get up to, like, we want to be the new Fast and Furious franchise. Ten Sonic movies, come on. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Zane. Um, Hello. My main question is, who idea was it that came up with the whole dot, dot, dot scene that Knuckles said? You know, I'm not even sure. That could have been a Jim idea, even even though it wasn't his uh, his line. Jim has a lot to say about the scenes that he's in. Um, which is why his scenes are so funny. Though it is funny because we write so many versions of so many different scenes. Like we're always not, not always sure what we wrote and what we didn't wrote. Yeah. I feel like recently someone asked us a actually. question about a line and Josh was like, I don't think we wrote that. And I was like, no, I very specifically remember us writing it. You just didn't remember that we did it. So <laughs> yeah, dot, wait. dot, dot, I, I don't remember. Yeah. It could have been us, but it also might not have been us. Hard to say. <laughs> it's a big, it's a Sorry blur. for the vague answer. <laughs> and then uh, one more question. Um, so if Jim Carrey was to retire, you guys said that you guys don't know yet. But anyway, if he did retire, how would the environment be without him? Because it sounded like he's like a very important person with the whole team and stuff. So how would it feel to you guys if he did retire? Like, how would everyone emotion be and stuff? Uh, I think we'd, I mean, you, I think it's, we'd be bummed out. Uh, he's an important part of the franchise, and he obviously brings so much to the table, um, both creatively and obviously, you know, the fans love him. So got to consider that. But, um, you know, but I mean, that's, you know, it's how franchises work again. If you just look at the, Fast and Furious franchise, that was a franchise where people were constantly popping in and out of it, and people unfortunately pass away. You know, you kind of got to move forward. We're still hoping and I mean, he'll, on he'll these come movies, back. But, yeah, I mean, we're hoping he'll come back, but it's like, really, we've had the same team making both the first two movies and the third one, too. It's like Jeff Fowler, the director, our fearless leader, Toby Asher, our producer, us writing. It's like a kind of a family environment. So even if we had to move forward without Jim, we would pull together and and, and yeah, do it, I, mean, I think. And most of everything would remain in place. And Sonic, the franchise has a lot 
of characters to draw from. So, well, but and I know uh, Sonic Two. If he does retire, you ended it on the proper note where you could move on with a new plot line without Robotnik necessarily in there. We, with ha- hashtag spoilers for anyone here who hasn't seen, seen yeah. the movie, <laughs> the, 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 the big climax at, at Sonic 2 at least gives you an opportunity where you haven't ridden yourself in, into a hole if for some reason you do have to move forward without Jim, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I mean, that's, we wouldn't have to suddenly explain why he's not there. So does that mean that you have to write two scripts, not one? Like one, one if Jim's back and one if there is no Jim? So we, we might have like Sonic 3 and Sonic 3 and a half? Uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. It's still very preliminary. We're in what we would call the blue sky phase of just kind of trying to think of every version that the movie could be while we're whittling it down to the movie it should be. We have another question? When is the new Sonic movie going to come out? When is the new Sonic movie coming out? Uh, uh, we, we don't know, know exactly yet, but... There's number three. If there's number yeah, three. They haven't, they haven't picked a date yet. I think we're all hoping, you know, two came out a little over two years after one. I, I think everyone's kind of hoping that three would come out a little over two years after two did. Yeah, it takes us about two years to make one of these movies. So I think we're, we're trying to get it going right now, and hopefully we'll have another movie in about two years. That's we also want to do, you know, we want to get it right. So I just have a particular question about how you work with, with the actors in those big budget productions. Like... How well do you collaborate with them on having a version of the character that kind of meets us in the middle of your writing and this, their performance? Um, I think every actor is different. Um, Jim, in particular, I think takes a lot of creative ownership of the character. Uh, and, you know, I mean, when you hire someone like Jim Carrey, that's what you want them to do. Um, and in some ways, you're kind of hoping that they'll do a lot of that comedy heavy lifting for you. I mean, and people like Ben Schwartz and Adam Pally are great improvisers, you know? So it's like, we're always hoping that that they'll add even more humor to the scenes than necessarily we, we write. But like, we're, we talk to them too about movies and just kind of what they're feeling about their characters even before we write them. I mean, Adam Pally was funny in the first movie. I felt like his first day on set because Wade's so stupid and he sort of was like, is Wade really this dumb or is he like messing with Tom? And we were like, oh, um, no, I think he's really this dumb. Yeah, and Adam really dumb. was like, okay, got it. And he went out there and nailed it. You know, he just needed that clarification and was, and was ready to do it. Just ready to go out there and be as stupid as we needed him to be. I love Adam well, Pally. He's such a great guy and he's so funny. People who haven't been on film sets before, they don't really understand the dynamic of the different roles that people play. So people know that a script is written first and then it gets picked up and then a directors and actors and filming and all that. But after a script is done, maybe you could explain what role you still have to play in the film after you've finished writing it. I mean, it changes from film to film. Uh, most often writers, once it's done, uh, don't have anything to do with it. Once it goes into production, like you might go visit set. I think in the, in our early indie days, that's why we would always write ourselves acting roles in the movies we were selling so that we could get to hang out. Sometimes it kind of feels like you help design a summer camp that then when summer comes, you don't actually go to. Uh, what Life of being a writer. But on Sonic 1 in particular, we got they brought us back while the movie was shooting to change things. Um, so in that one in particular, we were like, kind of more involved in the beginning, middle, and end than writers often are. Yeah, I mean, we would get the call that, like, Jim has some ideas for the scene tomorrow. Can you guys make these changes? And we would we would do it. Uh, and then even after the first movie was done shooting because of the fact that it got pushed back because of the design change, we ended up kind of in the editing room, too, helping shape the movie, which is pretty unusual for the writers to be involved in that way. Um, 
But I mean, at all these movies, I mean, Sonic 2, we went and, or we did not get to visit the set on Sonic 2 because of COVID. It was happening during COVID. Yeah. But our new movie about Santa, we were on set and we're pretty involved throughout the production too, rewriting it with, with the actors. John Leguizamo is the bad guy. He was like, I need a big villain speech that explains why I'm so evil. And so we wrote it for him. Yeah, and then like, he, you he got was it, great. Johnny Legs. <laughs> So guys, um, our our next person who's asking a question was one of our speakers earlier today, who's also a filmmaker and a professional puppeteer. And he made a film that both of you, like it practically was written for you guys. You have to see this film called Frank and Zed, somehow, some way. No, I have seen it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I've seen it. So we we have the filmmaker here, Jesse Blanchard. Jesse has a question for you. Josh has seen your film, man. Hello. Hey there. I have also seen your film. <laughs> well, that's great that you've actually seen it. That's, that's really exciting. So you've talked so much about kind of this continuous rewriting process, like on Sonic and some of your pro, uh, these other films. I'm curious, though, in what you might kind of consider like a, like a final rewrite or before you're really taking the script out or like kind of the the last phases when you're honing in on the script, like what does that look like? Or is it all continuous or, you know, the the old saw that writing is rewriting. I I mean, we definitely, well, I guess, uh, I, at least the way it means me, I'll let Pat answer is we definitely think writing is rewriting almost to the point though. It's just one long fluid process. And so usually it's something that we'll bump up against when we have other creative partners on projects. If they kind of get stuck being like, we really want to perfect act one. We're just kind of like, we just want to write the whole movie and then go back and then keep fixing it up. Like, you know, it's like a shark. You just got to keep moving forward. But it is certain like draft benchmarks where you want to get it as perfect as possible before you send it to the president of the studio or whoever you need to green light it, like certain things, like this is the draft. We got to get this perfect to get to your star. We got to get this draft perfect to, to be the, the official one that's going to get us green lit. Even though as soon as you're green lit, you just open it back up and start working on it again. Uh, so there are like these sort of benchmarks where you gotta, you gotta perfect it, but then yeah, you just leave it alone for just long enough for it to go out to whoever needs to see it. And, and then you just open it up again as soon as you get past that benchmark. So that guys, I uh, I get very big goal in the insatiable vibes when I watch Frank and Zed as if if Golan was a puppet, basically. Uh, you know, so Pat, you, you need to find some way to find Frank and Zed. But Josh, since you've seen it, uh, just so you guys know, we're actually screening Frank and Zed tomorrow night at the Oregon Tech Auditorium at 7 p.m. Tickets are 10 bucks. Uh, Josh, since you've seen it, what did you think of Jesse's film? I liked it. I'm trying to remember where I saw it. Was that it? Fantastic Fest? Yeah. Then that's maybe where I saw it. I mean, it played, it played at Fantasia last year but it actually didn't play fantastic fest fantastic fest last oh, year oh then it would have played fantastic fest i got this great note saying like hey in a normal year we would have played this but unfortunately we're only doing 10 films because of covid but it played fantasia but not fantastic fest well i can't you know anything you know and i probably watched it during lockdown and i feel oh. that entire year and a half is a weird blur uh, <laughs> <laughs> So you you guys have done animation and you've done interactive CG with, with live action. Have you ever considered a puppet project? Uh, we haven't talked about it super in depth, but I, I, I don't know if it, my mom, my mom was a flight attendant, but she volunteered at a puppet theater company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, where we grew up. And so I, you know, I, maybe that's why I always had an affinity for puppets, but you know, we grew up in the obviously Jim Henson era. I feel dark crystal was that movie. I would always make people watch in adulthood who hadn't seen it before. And they would get really bored and be like, you liked this movie when you were a kid. And I was like, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, 
We're, we we like puppets. I don't think we've ever really yeah, we've come never... close to making a puppet movie, but it's not impossible because uh, we enjoy the art form. Yeah. We have any other questions for Pat and Josh? We've got about 12 minutes before Comic-Con officially ends. So get in that last minute shopping and, yeah. Just a quick question. What advice would you have for recommendations for if you, how actors can work with writers better and be more collaborative in that process? You mean like on a production, like if you got cast in something or? Yeah, on the production level. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, obviously the problem is when you, once you're shooting, generally speaking, the, the director prefers that questions go to them and not the writers. Um, well, actually, it sort of depends. Like that, especially on a film, you want to talk to the director mostly, but on TV, TV like writers are almost always yes. on set. And you should go talk to the writer just to be like, hey, am I, TV am I doing very this different. right? Any I mean, questions you have about the background of your character or what they were thinking or what they're really looking for out of a scene, I'm sure that most writers will be happy to talk to you about yeah. it. Yeah, and that is true. On TV, the writers really are the equivalent of the directors. It's a, it's a, a different hierarchy. Um, but I mean, the one thing I would say as far as talking to writers is that the writers are the people script wise who've spent the most time thinking about just the script. Everyone else, you know, the director is a charge of all departments technically. And obviously they take the script very seriously. Um, but often, you know, they've maybe not thought about everything as deeply as say the writers are, or then the actor of that individual character. Well, fundamentally, um, at the end of the end of the day, you are the guys that are creating the story. So, yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you if you're on a production, um, I would certainly try to seek out. Again, it's a little weird if the writer is no longer involved. Then it would become weird if you're like, "Can I have the e email of that guy who hasn't worked on the movie in six <laughs> months?" Um, <laughs> But I would also advise, you know, like getting to know writers just in life, uh, working on things together, having things written for you. You know, that's that's the way in which writers again, that that's kind of the Jim Carrey relationship is uh, because he's he's a big star and he wants that level of involvement in a script before it's even done. Uh Usually the writers and the actors aren't meeting beforehand to talk about each individual part of the movie, you know, but you could make that happen as an actor. Would you say that might be a novel way to approach the process? I think so. I mean, I, you know, I think for us, our advice we always give to any filmmakers, and I think the same we go to actors is just be making stuff and getting it out there, even if you're just putting it on YouTube and only getting 20 views, you know, you never know. Yeah. Like it, our career has gone in directions. We didn't necessarily plan to, you know, we didn't like get a job in the proverbial mail room and work our way up in a company like that. Uh, I think we have benefited from just kind of putting ourselves out there and trying weird, different things. Um, so I'm assuming you are an actor and that's why you're asking these acting questions, but correct. Yeah, get, getting involved um, in a more yeah, unusual team up with way. some other yeah. actors and writers and directors just around your town and like, yeah, make make some small stuff just for YouTube and practice your craft. And and when those people then move up to the next level, they'll be like, hey, you know who we should get for this part? You know, yeah. that's like, we always are trying to cast our actor friends in our, our movies. And try to get somebody uh, to write something for get. you. Or I think a good example is always, uh, if you guys have watched the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia, all those guys were actors. They hadn't made anything, really, but they decided to create a TV show for themselves to act on and then shot a really low-budget, junky version of the pilot, and then the channel FX picked it up. You know, that was something they made happen for themselves as struggling actors. Okay. Uh, Sonic, did you also have a question? A Sonic, Sonic question. I did have, I did have we, we had some amazing costumes today, guys. I am yeah, so happy with how KCC yeah. Comic Con turned out. 
We've had like an entire month of hail and 30 knot winds like oh, every yeah. day, all day. And this was the first beautiful, like almost entirely blue skies day we've had in like almost a month. So we timed it just right for, for Comic-Con. <laughs> we had a huge crowd. Uh, I know we're kind of wrapping things up, but um, are there anything that you guys want to plug? Josh, I know you have a podcast. Pat, I know you're always working on a little side thing. So um, the floor is yours if there's anything else you want to mention. Yeah, I have a podcast called Best Movies Never Made. That is, I don't know if people have seen the documentary Yordorowski's Dune, which was about an attempt to make the movie Dune in the 70s. That like came very close, but would have been the most expensive movie ever made, never happened. But my buddy of mine, Steve, made a documentary about that. And our it's podcast a great is, documentary. A very good uh, documentary. And our podcast is an extension of that where each episode we talk about a different movie that didn't get made. Currently, we have a epic six-part series on all the attempts to make Batman before the Tim Burton movie. Uh, and Pat is on those episodes. That's true. I don't have a podcast to plug, but maybe you want to follow me on Twitter. It's uh, Pat underscore KC, like the letters K and C. Um, and I'm pretty active on there. And yeah, uh, go see Sonic 2 if you haven't already seen it. And remember to go see Violent Night this December, our, our Christmas movie starring David Harbour and John Leguizamo. It's going to be a lot of fun. And any uh, hidden gems from your past, too? I, I know we mentioned Hey, Stop Stabbing Me. But any, yeah, any which, other again, is, you guys have worked on in the past you also want to mention? Well, we'll plug Hey, Stop Stabbing Me again because that has been unavailable for years and has gotten re-released on Blu-ray. If you really want to watch a, a weird murder comedy made by a bunch of 20 year olds in a suburb um, of minnesota <laughs> i also plugged the show 12 deadly days which we made for youtube tv uh and i think that's probably the only place you can see it but it's a 12 part horror comedy uh christmas. anthology series of all scary stuff relating to christmas you can save that uh, one a lot until of fun. christmas <laughs> yeah <laughs> With that, guys, we will say thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedule to join us. We really appreciate you helping us culminate KCC Comic Con with a bang. Let's hear it for Pat and Josh, the writers of Sonic the Hedgehog. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. It looks like a lot of fun. I'm glad you guys, this convention looks like yeah. a blast. Maybe next time we can have you guys, or one, one or both of you guys actually be here in person for it. We'd love to have you on, on board again in the future. Fun, fun. Thanks, guys. Uh, before we call it quits for KCC Comic Con, I'm going to show them the trailer for Golan the Insatiable so that they can see this amazing animated show that these two guys made that is so underappreciated and is a much swatch on Hulu. Do you guys want to preface about what Golan the Insatiable was about? Yeah, I don't even remember this trailer. Uh, it was So this show was based on... Uh, a series of sh like, I want to call them short stories, but that's not really what they were. Uh, things I wrote on the internet that then Pat and I turned into a very fun, but short lived Fox animated show that was on a equally short lived programming block on Fox on Saturday nights called Fox ADHD that had a bunch of different shows that were all like 15 minutes long, kind of trying to do the adult swim thing. But the premise is basically that Golan is sort of a heavy metal demon from sort of a Conan the Barbarian fantasy dimension who's gotten stuck in a small town in Minnesota and his best friend is a little girl who hates everything and wants him to conquer the world. But he is it's too, too lazy. lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, great to see you as always. If you're ever up in Oregon, hit me up and thank you of course, for Kurt. all that you've done to help us out with Klamath Film and today with KCC. And Josh, pleasure to finally meet you, sir. I've heard so much about you, and I'm a big fan of your work. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. We're, we're going to check out Golden Insatiable and then uh, call it a night for KCC Comic Con. <laughs>